In 2005, Dane Cook was listed as the world's most famous comic, although despite being known by an audience of millions, he was notably hated by every other comedian. A comedy radio host stated, Not one comedian comes on my show and says I'm so happy for him, which is weird. They can't stand this poor guy, the reason for which being jealousy, at least according to Dane. A lot of jealousy, a lot of animosity that I, at a young age, was famous, hanging around with beautiful women, rich. Although the real reason might have been because Dane had stolen their jokes, given he was called out for copying a bit done by Louis C.K. You can name your kid anything you want. I like that part. I like to give my kid an interesting name, you know? Like a name with no vowels, maybe, you know? Just like 40 Fs, that's his name. I already have names picked out. I don't even know. First kid, boy, girl, I don't care. The first one that comes out, I'm naming it. I think it's beautiful. It's feminine, but strong at the same time. Time for bed. I said time for bed. Fans then noticed Dane had also copied a bit by Dimitri Martin at around the same time. I went into a shoe store and I said, uh, hey, can I get those in a 10? You guys said, sure, and he went in the back. And a couple minutes later, he came out and he goes, I don't have a 10, I have a nine. Great. Because while you were in the back, my toes were severed off. She walks out. She comes up to me, you guys, so enthusiastic, such like optimism. She's holding a boot. She comes right up to me and she goes, um, we have it in a nine. Wi-Fi bill funds. Oh yeah, bro. It's getting there. It's getting there. It's getting there. Big up Stinger Goo. Big up the insults. Big up the fucking, you know, the fucking insults and criticism of our Wi-Fi. I'm feeling it now. A go makes so much dollar but still uses kebab shop Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's not kebab shop Wi-Fi. <laughs> Haven't been able to jump on the streams cause work's been hectic but big up saws. Raised fist, peace sign. <laughs> Big up. Illusionary commission, go fuck yourself, okay? Illusionary commission, wherever you are in the world, go fuck yourself. It's not kebab shop Wi Fi. I've actually got fiber optic. <laughs> kebab shop Wi Fi. You know what's funny about that? There's actually a kebab shop across the road from me. <laughs> And sometimes their Wi-Fi shows up on my list. That's what makes it extra funny. <laughs> that I'll be trying to ping from this Wi-Fi across the fucking road. Oh my god, my eyes actually. Sorry. Oh, that was funny. That got me. And big up Dark Web J. Appreciate you, brother. Big up Dark Web J. Oh god. Oh god, that was fun. That was funny. That was actually, actually, actually funny. So big up, big up, you guys. <laughs> Kebab shop Wi-Fi is so rude. <sighs> um. Anyway, going back to um, going back to fucking um, going back. Hey, yo, big up BT BTF Wayne, my fellow Negro. We're talking about white men with loads of money. That's what we're doing here. We're laughing and pointing to go white men with loads of money. <laughs> um, you know what? This is funny about this whole thing. Did I say before that? Did I mention this before? I don't know if I did. Um, I think more comedians need to embrace the fact that they're just jealous deep down and that, that's okay. I think jealousy to some point is an okay emotion to have. I think maybe when it kind of goes into envy, that's when it becomes an issue. But I think being jealous of another comedian that has way more than you is perfectly normal, I think. Especially because the disparity is so fucking crazy. Like, imagine if you're Dimitri Martin. I don't know who Dimitri Martin is, but I'm going to assume when Dane Cook was red hot, Dimitri Martin wasn't making anywhere near as much money as Dane Cook was making. Yet Dane Cook was out here, allegedly, by the evidence we have available, stealing his jokes and being paid way more money to perform the same jokes, you know, that he has essentially by stealing them. So isn't it perfectly okay if you're Dimitri Martin to be jealous of Dane Cook's success at the time because he was a rock star comedian who had all the young hot girls, fast cars, loads of money. Isn't that perfectly a normal reaction to have? I almost feel like this Rogan, this Rogan-like 
positive this rogan like toxic positivity they all have where it's like oh yeah we all get along we all get each other on a podcast um you know there's enough tickets to go around for everybody if we get each other on our show we can help it's like yeah but not really we've seen with the podcast bubble there is not that many fans out there there is a finite amount of fans that you can tap into that you can kind of run the pockets of there's not a lot of you know there's not a lot of new fans either to get because you know these guys just aren't that funny so it's no surprise that if you're a comedian and you're coming up and another comedian is making 10 times what you're making isn't it okay to be jealous like honestly if you're if you're a good comedian and you're seeing Bert selling out arenas every week and he's just taking off his shirt and he's getting fucking crazy you know responses from the crowd and he's telling those shitty jokes about his daughter and about his wife doing something funny isn't it perfectly normal for you to be jealous shouldn't that be something that should motivate you to actually try to you know make it and you know whatever i don't know i feel like some of these guys are lying to themselves that they aren't jealous and trying to frame it as they are you know these joke fucking purists or something it's like really are you a com are you a stand-up comedy purist or are you just more annoyed that this way more successful way more rich um comedian is stealing your jokes and making way more money doing it that's perfectly okay to say I don't know, man. I feel like they should just admit it. <laughs> Great. You guys also have a bone saw anywhere nearby? With Patrick CC running through even more examples in this video before touching on another reason Dane Cook is hated. His joke about the Batman movie theater shooting. So I heard that uh, the guy came into the theater about 25 minutes into the movie. I don't know if you've seen the movie. The movie's pretty much a piece of crap. Pretty sure that somebody in that theater about 25 minutes in realizing it was a piece of crap probably was like, oh, f Shoot me. The controversial joke. The controversial bit isn't the shooting thing. The controversial thing is him saying the movie was terrible. It's arguably one of the best. Like what? That's a terrible opinion. But you know what? Don't you miss it when comedians had something to say? Look at that. He had a point of view. Don't you miss it when comedians had a point of view that was a little bit dicey, a little bit edgy? Don't you miss that? What what happened to what happened to that? Now they're telling us about COVID. Now they're talking to us about what? About the fucking slap. Will Smith slapping fucking, you know, what's his name? They, um, Chris Rock. I miss when comedians have something to say, for better or worse. Resulted in article after article, as well as Twitter posts reading, anyone who knows me knows I think Dane Cook is the single worst comedian ever. <laughs> he's never been funny. Now he's just an awful human being. But while Dane Cook isn't liked for his disrespectful and sometimes stolen jokes, Theo Vaughn is hailed for his unusual originality. His sense of humor has been described as so creative, unique, hilarious, and unorthodox that I can't compare him to any other comedian, which summarizes Theo Vaughn perfectly. There's a few guys, Theo's one of them, that have like a style of comedy that you will never be able to explain to someone. They gotta go see him. When you hear him say, we had this one guy, you know you're about to hear a wild- It's just a shame his stand-up isn't as good as his podcast appearances because on podcast, he's on another level. But when it comes to stand-up, he's not that great, in it? It's just such a shame that he can't seem to translate that humor he has on pods on the stage. It's just not the same. It's just like a, it's just a bit like, oh. This is rough, but on a pod, he will legitimately make you cry with laughter story full of bizarre situations and metaphors described in the strangest yet most perfect way possible. This gentleman had half a limb and which, he was, which, uh, which limb? he was missing part of his leg, I mm -hmm. think, or he said he was, so he could have been faking it. Mm -hmm. CGI or something? <laughs> I don't know what his name was. <laughs> <laughs> CGI. It was Come on, man. That's brilliant. Come on, man. Rewind it. That's fucking brilliant. <laughs> what his name was. Come on, man. That's fucking brilliant. Feels on another level. Especially on the Jocko podcast, which is really kind of serious, to be fair. So... Oh, that was brilliant. Let's go back a bit. Perfect way possible. This one gentleman had half a limb. And which, he was... Which, uh, which limb? He was missing part of his leg, I mm -hmm. think. Or he said he was. So he could have been faking it. Mm -hmm. CGI or something? I don't know what his name was. 
<laughs> CJ, it was, no, it was a white dude. Okay, Jack. Yeah. He's the absolute king of the metaphor. Whenever he says something is kind of like etc., it's always the funniest, most outlandish comparison I've ever heard. You look like a guy if somebody had a cheat code in Double Dragon, bro. <laughs> and they got to use an ultimate character, man. Yeah, damn, Tony. Hey, man, dude. Locked it. There are multiple compilations dedicated to Theo Von's absolutely wild sayings, although at the same time, he's able to show his softer, more vulnerable side in moments where it's appropriate. Theo's podcast this past weekend has risen to become the seventh most popular podcast on Spotify, while Brennan Shorb's bear. Hold on, what's the list? What's the list there? What's the list there? What's the list? The top podcast globally. Top 10. Joe Rogan Experience, Cooler Daddy, Human Lab. Human Lab is top three podcast listened to. Wow, I didn't know that. God damn. Anything goes with Emma Chamberlain. On purpose with Jay Shetty. Oh, Jay Shetty's the guy with the eyes, isn't it? The Indian dude that just stares at me with the eyes. I have light eyes, so I have wisdom. Stare into my eyes, you'll be rich. That guy is full of fucking shit. Happiness will make the world heal. It's like, what? Hugs. Hugs can end a war. Hugs. If you hug me, I don't get boner. It's like, huh? What? the fuck is that um crime junkie this past weekend serial killers the diary of a ceo is steve bartlett oh yeah big up the uk big up steve bartlett fellow black brother even though he doesn't probably think he's black but big up steve bartlett ted talks daily relatos de la noche um casa 63 um something called what's that pisa golagio al des desundanda the daily Lex Friedman podcast is in the top 20. Shit, Armchair Expert. Wow, I've not listened to Armchair Expert in a while. Do you guys listen to Armchair Expert? I used to, I used to listen to that before, but I stopped. I think the other girl got started to get on my nerves. I, I quite liked it for a bit, but then the girl, the other co-host, she started to get on my nerves. But I haven't listened to it in a long time. Um, El Podcast de Marina Rojas Estape, um, whatever that is. The psychology of your twenties, stuff you should know, smart list. There's a lot of Spanish speaking podcasts on here, isn't it? God, fuck. Jordan Peterson's on there too. Fuck yeah. Has risen to become the seventh most popular podcast on Spotify, while Brennan Shorb's bad reputation has caused his podcast to trend in the opposite direction. Brennan had previously been a UFC fighter. However, after a string of losses, he was convinced by Joe Rogan and Brian Callen to retire and instead pursue comedy. You have a future in other things and you're really good at. Like, you're really funny. You say funny shit. <laughs> We have to blame these guys for fucking Gringo Pappy and you'd be surprised. We have to blame these guys for... We have to blame them, innit? We have to, innit, right? You're really funny, you know? Like, really, though? To be fair, though, they're right. They were right. Brendan was funny on... Let's, just, let's not rewrite history. There was a time where Brendan was really funny on podcast, but he could never translate that to the stage. And then he let the fame get to his head and he thought he could, doesn't need to work at his jokes or anything. You know? That's the issue. Like, he was quite funny on pods. He could have translated to a stage, but he didn't. And then he obviously got a big head when the podcast started becoming successful and he was making a bunch of money. He obviously thought, you know, no one could tell me shit. And, you know, the rest is history. It, man. Yeah, you do. You have a ridiculous talent. But... Although with comments on Brennan's stand-up like, this is the best example of normal people thinking they're funny because they make their friends laugh, his sets aren't exactly the greatest. His first stand-up special titled You'd Be Surprised received an IMDb rating of 1.4 out of 10 stars Jesus. and was labelled in front of millions as the worst comedy special I've ever seen. It was wow, so that beige frequency has got 2.7 So bad that even Joe Rogan made a few little jokes about it. The first one I would have probably tried to talk you out of it, but I already talked you out of fighting. Yeah. And I was like, I can't talk him out of this too. However, for Brendan, the worst was yet to come. That's a funny, that's one of the most funny back and forths I've ever seen because that was also around the era of the time where Brendan admitted in fucking 4K that the reason why he didn't listen to Brian Cannon and Joe Rogan, because we learned that after, we didn't know the fact. We, I think a lot of people online, myself included in the Bapaverse, were like, why didn't Brendan, why didn't Joe Rogan tell him not to t take the fucking Showtime deal? Why didn't Brian Cannon tell him not to do that fucking special? You'd be surprised. Like, why did they not tell him to do that? Why did they tell him not to do it? And then we find out via Brendan that, no, 
Rogan and Callan told him not to take the Showtime deal. They both told him not to do You'd Be Surprised so early in his career. He said it wouldn't end well. He didn't listen to them because guess what? Yes, you guessed it. He thought they were jealous. He didn't listen to, Bren, to Brian and Joe Rogan at that time because he thought they were jealous of his success and they were trying to hold him back. That's why, you know, he's hopeless. And if you're out there hoping for a redemption arc, it's never going to happen. That kind of narcissism, that kind of ego, that kind of delusion, it can never be cured. Like, it's never happening. This guy's in his 40s now with three kids. It's not going to suddenly change. That guy's finished. Years after his first special, Brendan Shaw released another one titled Gringo Papi, which received an even lower IMDb score of 1.1 out of 10 stars, meaning he was unable to sell it to a major buyer like Netflix. Instead, he uploaded the special to his- Come on, do you think that you can't sell specials because of a low rating on IMDb? That's not how it works. I don't think so, right? Just because you get a low rating doesn't mean you're like, huh? I don't think that's how that works. I don't think they judge what they buy based on IMDb ratings. I don't think so. I, I don't know. I could be wrong. YouTube channel where it received an 85% dislike ratio and comment. Fucking hell. 236,000 thumbs down to 42,000 thumbs up. 80, was it 85 percent dislike he said god damn that is brutal comments such as damn this guy sure has some hidden talent hope he finds it one day every time i feel down i watch gringo papi then i realize whatever has me down or whatever <laughs> adversity i am facing isn't as bad as this comedy special you know it's a brennan shorb stand-up special when the comments are funnier than the actual video with the stand-up again being labeled as the worst comedy special of all time it seems brendan's main problem is that he isn't very skilled and the audience has therefore been gravitating towards shane gillis he got his Big break in 29. The guy that Brendan said it was not funny. Remember that? When Shane Gillis got fired from SNL for that racy, dicey Asian joke, and Brendan was like, Yeah, he's just not funny. Like, imagine Brendan saying you're not funny. <laughs> That's a fucking insult, bro. That's an insult. That's like Peggy Goo telling me I'm not a good DJ. It's like, what? 19 after being cast on Saturday Night Live, which he was then fired from immediately after the media dug up controversial comments made on his podcast. And then I got cancelled immediately. You got cancelled on the way. They literally were like, how about this guy? And everyone was like, no. Shane responded by- Best thing to happen to his career though. Best thing to happen to his career. By writing, I'm a comedian who pushes boundaries. Sometimes I miss. If you go through my 10 years of comedy, most of it bad, you're going to find a lot of bad misses. But while this made him unsuitable for SNL... Yeah, that's true. I heard about that too, the fuss. That Shane's podcast, My Secret Time, whatever, is um, number one on Patreon. Imagine that. Number one on Patreon. Of all the comedy podcasts that exist out there, and how they do things imagine that one being number one like and they're just laid back suiting the shit making each other laugh i mean it's not i don't, I don't say it because they don't deserve it i'm just saying it more so in terms of their style of a show and the fact that they just they just quietly do it you don't hear them bragging about their numbers you don't hear them you know i'm a beast you know what i mean they just quietly do fucking great <laughs> you, you have to you have to love it you have to love it you just quietly do it great this was ironically exactly what the wider comedy audience wanted. No wonder SNL fired him, he's actually funny. This in combination with the mountains of press from the incident took Shane's popularity to a whole new level. The months after SNL, our yeah, listenership I, um, probably- Yeah, exactly. Agree with Uche, agree with you. Um, agree with you. Oh, big up Drone Adventures. Big up, long time no see, brother. I hope you're good. Um, but yeah, big up Uche, big up uh, The Watcher too. The Theo episode, if you haven't watched it, please do. It's so funny. You know what makes it funnier? The fact that they leave all the awkward pauses in there. And I think, you know, Matt and Shane are probably, you know, experts. That's probably why. They just leave the little awkward bits in between where, like, you feel you're trying to think of things to say and they're, like, falling over it, like, kind of, like, stepping over each other with what they're saying and stuff. It's really funny. I love it. I'm not going to lie. It's really, really funny. Um, they let him rock. They lean into the jokes a bit. They're really as, they're basically as quick as him, really, but they let him shine. It's amazing. It's really, really, really good.
quadrupled because then people heard about it and watched it. So it's helped the podcast. Like, this is actually funny. So yeah. it's helped the podcast. Tremendous. Only made crazier when he'd post his live set in Austin, which gained over 20 million views by touching on funny political topics, although in a good way where it felt like he didn't have an agenda. And I don't want to be on the other side of it where it's like, I'm a free speech guy. It's like, dude, I don't want to be involved in any of this. I right. just want to do comedy. Shane's great attitude and likable personality has made him the most subscribed. Um, Coilus asks, and was it Coilus said, Does Ben from Tim Dillon show Paul Nadav numbers? I'm just checking my phone now to see it. His podcast is called Lemon Party, and no. Um, last episode four days ago got 17,000 views, the other one got 19. So it's, it's decent. Do you know what I mean it's, it's decent views to be fair, considering they're, they're not well known guys? I don't think who is it who does a pod with is Ben Avery a guy called Devin Costa and somebody called Jace Avery. So I, I don't know who they are. Maybe that Jace guy's his brother, maybe. But for three relatively unknown guys to get 17,000 per episode is pretty decent. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. What do you guys think? Let's see what the most popular episode is. The most popular episode is a is episode they did with a guy called... Oh, it's, it, it's with Matt, with Matt from uh, Matt and Shane. They did an episode with him that got 76,000. And they also did an episode with Jordan Peterson that got 67,000. So that's pretty decent. I'm not going to lie. That's pretty good. Uh, let's actually check out their fucking, um, probably have the numbers on there. Ooh, their Patreon. They do bits on Patreon. Fuck. Their Patreon, they've got 6,414 members and they make $24,000 or 24,000 pounds per month. The Patreon is fucking booming. Last post on the Patreon was what? 14 hours ago. God damn. They probably make more on Patreon than they do on YouTube. That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> like, they probably get way more views on Patreon than they get on YouTube. That's, that's an interesting tactic. I like that. Big up Lemon Party. I person on Patreon with around 75,000 paid members in comparison to Carrot Top, whose style was so unique the whole industry turned against him. He gained popularity as a prop comic in the 90s, but while his shows were extremely smart and absolute- Is the hate of- is the hate for Lem- for Carrot Top a bit over- over-egged and stuff? It's not- it's not deserved, is it? The hate he gets, because he's goofy and whatnot and looks weird. But what does he actually do that's bad? Absolutely hilarious. OJ Simpson's football. Okay, go deep, honey. Go deep. Go. Get, get. His bizarre looking style made him a punching bag for anybody and everybody. You're a funny guy, man. And you oh, take, you at least used to take a lot of shit. And I, I, I never understood I it. Never under, I never understood I don't either. I never have, I would get shit for everything. It's like Nickelback. This became most obvious when Carrot Top simply flew over his city in a fighter jet. And the next day on the front page of the paper, Carrot Top disrupted city with flyover <laughs> and everyone's up in arms because this the, the building shook and everybody was yeah, like sure. oh what there's a war happening <laughs> and, and I, think, I think they were really honestly just pissed because it was me honestly i'd much rather watch fucking carrot top live than burt any day of the week give me a carrot top show i'll watch that happily i'd happily watch carrot top perform live than fucking burt kreischer I don't understand the hate he gets, man. It's undeserved. And in a Reddit thread talking about him, the only reasons people had to hate Carrot Top was he's annoying, not fun and comes across as a gigantic douchebag, which pretty much confirms the theory. Carrot Top's name has become synonymous with bad comedian we should make fun of. In another article, Carrot Top was described as the most successful comedian no one will admit to liking, with one of these haters being another comedy legend. So it's Bill Burr just going coals on me. I mean, just right? <laughs> I mean, just bad. Who then apologized to Carrot Top after meeting him in person. And then when I finally meet him- uh, See, that's why I love Bill Burr too. That's why I like Bill Burr. That's why you got to stand Bill Burr. He stands in his shit. When he doesn't like you, he doesn't like you. But then if he meets you and you're cool, he'll put his hands up and say, I'm sorry. Bill Burr's a legend. He was like, yeah. dude, I'm so sorry. Like, he came and hugged me. And Carrot Top was hated for so long that he's now considered a legend. They're kind of like saying, you know what? Jeez, we, we, he won't go away. We've been <laughs> ripping on him, but he's, he's, for some reason, he's still around. And uh, you know what? Like, he can stay now. You had somebody to earn my wings. With Bobby Lee having earned his wings in a similar kind of way. Fuck Bobby Lee. I'm not going to lie. Fuck Bobby Lee. There's something about that fucking P 
Peter Pan thing. I'm an old guy, but I don't grow up thing. It rubs me up the wrong way. I don't know why. I'm going to have to start a whole entire channel on hating on Bobby Lee. Yeah. One of the things that makes Bobby Lee so likable is his ability to laugh at himself for the sake of audience entertainment. Bro, you're the worst looking of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he is out of 10? For real. You're a two, buddy. Two, buddy. <laughs> You're like a two and a half at most, probably closer to a one and a half. Give me a bigger number. You, okay, okay. You want an honest no, number? No, honest. Okay, okay. You want the honest please, number? Please. I was being generous as a one and a half. <laughs> I'm a one and a half? Something <laughs> close to 1.7 Did you say one? Showing that he's comfortable in his own skin. This helps him deliver some of the most savage roasts on the internet. My dad abandoned me, but then I love my mom. <laughs> In your face! <laughs> he doesn't have a dad! <laughs> Although just... <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> He doesn't. <laughs> That's funny. Come on. You can't have to laugh. I have to, I have to rewind it. That's fucking funny. My dad abandoned me, but then I love my mom. <laughs> In your face. <laughs> he doesn't have a dad. <laughs> yeah, I take it back. I, I like Bobby Lee now. I, I take it back. I like him now. I don't care that he's an adult baby. You know, I take it back now. I like him. I like him. <laughs> Although just like Theo Vaughn, his fans also have a lot of respect for how open he is with his addiction issues and sobriety. Right before I was gonna get on the plane, I looked at my girlfriend and said, I'm gonna relapse. When it comes to Bobby Lee's stand-up, a Reddit user wrote, I've seen him do the same set at the comedy store like three or four times, and I nearly cried laughing each time, while another person called it the hardest I've laughed at a comedy show of a decent slate of shows. It seems Bobby Lee finds love from the audience regardless of what he's doing. Sure what I've heard that he does the same routine though. You know, I've heard he does the same routine. That's the only issue. He's still doing the same routine now. While the audience has recently been finding many reasons to hate Tom Segura. At the start of his career, Tom Segura was one of the more humble comedians. However, after losing over 50 pounds and building a net worth of 12 million, his ego became incredibly obvious. He'd begin to joke about the general population by calling them poors. So I've received a remarkable number of messages, countless poor people, about the use of a washcloth in the shower. And, um, you know, it's kind of well known. It's what poors do. However, it quickly became obvious that he wasn't really joking. Every time we talk about like a watch or a car, I'll get this, uh, like a, a bunch of messages from losers that try to tell me that mm -hmm. I I'm making them Oz team up with Brandon and run a Bobby Lee Hicks subreddit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, yeah. The real, the real Bobby Lee Hicks subreddit. That would be good. The real one. And then in our banner, we'll have um, Stevie Weeby. Stevie Weeby will be in the banner. If you know, you know. Stevie will be in the banner. If you know, you know. Big up, Asad. Appreciate you, brother feel bad about their situation. I'm struggling with rent this month. Figure it the f*** out. In October 2023, Tom tweeted about being inconvenienced by American Airlines. And after being called in- What do you think about the American Airlines thing? What do you think that? What do you think that? What do you think that? The American Airlines tweet. Do we think it was real? Or do we think it was fake? Was he trying to lean into it, or was it a, f or was it like a re like? I'm starting to think he was actually being for real. I don't think that was a bit. I think he was being for real. I think he was actually furious. I don't buy that it was a bit. I think he was actually mad, like mad, mad, like big Karen mad. You know. Entitled by his fans, Tom responded by stating all the pores and losers have the same response. Oh, you were inconvenienced. Well, you should accept it. That's what me and my dumb poor family have done for generations. This is why you're poor. In his next tweet, he'd respond to a f I don't know how he thought that would work. That would go down well. Honestly, bro. <laughs> you dumb poor family. 
banned by simply writing poor, while a third tweet read, the lowest level poors get upset, as they've been trained to do when you point out they're happy to do what I'm told servant mentality. They don't value time because their time is worthless. You are specks of shit on a washcloth and washcloths belong in the trash. The rant instantly turned Tom into laughing stock for the internet. Probably not that much money left over for the guys in the booth either. Oh, it's man. all Tom and Christina just running around. <laughs> <laughs> Getting on private jets. Uh -huh. Making fun of poor people. While others dug deep to find his wealth was likely inherited. It turns out Tom was a trust fund kid. His father was the vice president and chief financial advisor of Merrill Lynch for 25 years. Can you imagine that? The way he's talking. Papa fucking Segura was chief financial advisor of Merrill Lynch for 25 years. God damn. Tom never missed a meal, mate. Tom never missed. That's why you're so fat. He never missed a meal. And this is like, what's that? This is vice president of Merrill Lynch. This is like, what? This is like in the 80s, 90s. That, that's big money, bro. That is big fucking money. God damn president and chief financial advisor of Merrill Lynch for 25 years until he took over as the vice president and CFA for the Bank of America. His Big up Papa Segura, man. RIP to him. He was, he went on to be fucking of Bank of America. Fucking beast. His obituary mentions that he was a member of the Quail Valley Golf Club in Vero Beach, where a membership will run you a very modest 85 that's a membership. Papa Segura's membership to his golf club is more than most people's salary. A membership. Is that per year? Yo, Papa Segura was balling. RIP to the fucking top dog, the fucking legend. RIP to him, man. He must have been balling. Holy shit. $5,000 a year, not counting all of the other fees. This led Tom to remove the entire chain of airport tweets and avoid every question that might imply he's rich. What kind of car you have? Which what? What kind? You have cars? Yeah, I How like cars. How many cars you got? You all right? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm Tom Segura has no excuse for being a douchebag, given Gabriel Iglesias is substantially Yay, richer. Fluffy, one of my favorites as well. I love Fluffy. And is one of the most humble comedians. When you type Gabriel Iglesias controversy into Google, it seems the worst thing he's ever done is pay a fine to a venue for spending too much time recording a Netflix special. A Back in 2014, one of these specials was leaked and uploaded to YouTube for free, although instead of issuing a copyright takedown, down, he'd share the links to his Facebook, adding, I can't believe someone posted a direct link to watch my fluffy specials online for free. The nerve. I hope no one shares or watches these before they get taken down, what? prompting a top co- Imagine, imagine Andrew Schultz doing that. Never happening. Imagine Andrew Schultz doing that. Imagine Brenda or YouTube, but imagine Andrew Schultz ever doing this for his fans. Never happening. Comment reading, this is why you're awesome Fluffy, you don't whine about getting pirated, you promote it. Gabriel's nickname Fluffy is a joke about his own weight, which like Bobby Lee shows he's comfortable in his own skin. Although at the same time, Gabriel explained to Joe Rogan that he'd recently lost 70 pounds as a result of following better habits. And it was bad habits that led Carlos Mencia to become incredibly hated. The collapse of his reputation began after Joe Rogan wrote a blog post titled, Carlos Mencia is a weak-minded joke thief which read the late oh, wow you, you, it was a blog post wow bro brogan was on his karen shit back in the day and he? he was a fucking knock he wrote a blog post about it i didn't know i thought it just confronted him on stage he wrote a blog post <laughs> Just the most disgusting joke thief of all is a guy named Carlos Mencia. The really crazy thing is that's not even his real name. He sells himself as being Mexican, but the reality is his real name is Ned Holness, and he's actually half German and half Honduran. The Mexican hook is something he did to integrate himself with the local Mexican population of LA where he started. That's From what, you know what? That's probably what Brendan should have done. Brendan probably should have done that. Brendan should have actually leaned into the Mexican thing and actually tried to LARP as a Mexican. That actually probably would have worked better for him. You know? 
instead of what he did. Like, he actually should have probably leaned into it. He's probably got more, and he probably looks more Mexican than Carlos Mencia, probably to some people anyway, especially if he tans. Here, Joe began calling him Carlos Menstelia before confronting him on stage in an actual comedy club, which was recorded and uploaded to YouTube. It's easy to say you steal shit, but I don't, because I'm not a little bitch. I think that every time you open your mouth and you talk about me, I think that you're secretly in love with me. Despite denying the allegations, Carlos was then exposed for stealing from Bill Cosby and Ari Shafia, after which Carlos made the crazy decision to own the fact that he stole all his jokes. His attitude was this, like, yeah, I steal. If I'm in the back of the room, you better watch your material because yeah, I'll take yeah. it, remix it, and make it a hit. From here, almost every comedian destroyed Carlos Mencia. A lot of your material are not. Yeah, this is one of the this is one of the most painful podcast episodes to ever watch. I don't recommend it. Carlos Mencia on Tiger Belly. It was painful because Bobby Lee still likes him as a friend. I think Bobby Lee kind of came up underneath him and stuff. Right? They were kind of uh, Carlos Mencia was kind of his mentor or something. Um, oh, it was brutal, boy. Bobby was trying so hard to help him and he just would refuse to admit the stealing, would kind of make excuses, just pure narcissism on display. It was really tough to listen to. I'm not going to lie. The guy is fucking delusional. Um, but, you know, he's in his own little bubble and guess like, whatever it may be, but it was strange. Very, very strange podcast. Not saying all of it, but a lot of your material was too similar to Paul Mooney or Bill Hicks. And he went from performing in stadiums to small clubs. There's a heavy price to pay for cutting corners in comedy, whereas Chris Rock discovered there's much to gain in the power of a single slap. Chris Rock has been admired and respected since the mid 1980s, although it seems being slapped by Will Smith made him even more loved. Ironically, the Will Smith slap made Chris a beloved winner. Will Smith accomplished the impossible with one targeted slap. Now everybody loves Chris. This was reinforced when Dave Chappelle was attacked on stage, after which Chris Rock jumped on the mic to ask, Is that Will Smith? Chris Rock just proved that if someone does you wrong in life, just wait, and the perfect moment will present itself. Proud of Chris Rock. He didn't let the Will Smith incident take him to a place of bitterness and anger, but stays humble and even makes a joke out of such a difficult spot to be in. There could not have a more perfect moment to drop that line. And the fact that Chris Rock wasn't really talking about the altercation before leading up to this just adds to the perfection of his delivery. And when Chris Rock did address the controversy in his special, he reinforced a winner's mindset. But I'm not a victim, baby. You will never see me on Oprah or Gail. I couldn't believe it. And I love men in black. No, I took that hit like Pacquiao. <laughs> Oprah. But yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. Anyways, my friends, that was an amazing video. Recommend you check it out. Sunny V2. Um, good little video there. You see the fucking title. You know the vibes. Let's put a little upvote on there for the guy. But yeah, 1.4 million views is fucking crazy, bro. It's fucking crazy. Anyways, my friends, I have to love you and leave you. It is now 6 a.m. here in London. Um, time has gone by very, very quickly. And the rest of the stuff I need to talk about will probably catch up on another random show. We'll probably end up doing later tonight or maybe tomorrow or Monday. So keep an eye out for that one. Um, but thank you.